Today's video is sponsored by NordVPN. Whether you're one of my long-term followers, or you've only heard a few of the mysteries I've covered, you've probably realised the value of staying safe and secure, even while surfing the web. With most of us spending multiple hours each day online, myself included, it's safe to say the internet knows a lot about us. Unfortunately, these days, there are plenty of people out there trying to get their hands on that data of yours. One of the best ways to protect yourself while online is by using a VPN. That's where Nord comes in. NordVPN is extremely reliable and convenient, with super fast servers and 24-7 customer support. Want to stay hidden online? Nord's got your back with double data encryption for increased anonymity. Want more peace of mind? Their VPN protects your communications and your personal data, and makes hacking into your devices virtually impossible. With NordVPN, your information will always be protected. If you find yourself in another country, their VPN really comes in handy. You can keep up with all your favourite shows that would otherwise be region locked. So whether you're on the other side of the planet, chilling in your local cafe, or just working at home, having NordVPN installed offers you both convenience and security. Right now they have a special Christmas deal running. Head over to nordvpn.com forward slash masquerade, or use coupon code masquerade, and you'll make a huge 68% saving, plus an extra 4 months for free. NordVPN offers a 30 day money back guarantee, so you've really got nothing to lose. Find that unique URL in the description or comment section, and take advantage of that spine chilling 68% discount, plus an extra 4 months, absolutely free. So before the video starts, you're probably asking yourself, lazy, what on earth's a region lock mystery? It's a term I use to describe mysteries that are only well known in their countries of origin. For example, there could be a case that's infamous in, say, Japan, but that was never picked up on by Western media sites, or that was perhaps just never translated into English in the first place. As such, that mystery is quote-unquote region locked. You either have to hear about it from a local, or speak the language well enough to not only find it online, but also read about it. The ones I'm examining in this video are still pretty unheard of in the West, and I can assure you, they're all equally bizarre, unsettling, and sensational. So let's get into it. Here are three mysteries from other countries that you've probably never heard of before. We'll start with a wild case from Malaysia that has all the ingredients of a gory B-movie. Political intrigue, the occult, and a wannabe pop star turned axe-wielding maniac. All the Malaysians in the audience already know who I'm talking about, but for the rest of you, that wannabe pop star was Mona Fandi, and this is her story. Born Nur Masna Ismail in 1956, Mona Fandi grew up in Kangar, Perlis, and from a young age, craved attention. She loved nothing more than singing and water ballet, and had big dreams of becoming a global superstar. When she met Mohammed Nora Fandi Abdul Rahman, her biggest fan with enough cash to fund her dream, Mona wasted no time in getting him to put a ring on her finger. Now with a wealthy husband to pay for studio time, she was able to release a full-length pop album called Diana. She even managed to get onto several TV shows and sing a few tracks for the whole nation to hear, link to one of those performances down in the bio. Mona's beautiful melodies and dulcet tones quickly captured the hearts of Malaysians and people everywhere, and within months was the most successful artist in the country's history. Here's what she would have wanted to happen. In reality, her record was actually a flop, and it quickly became apparent that her career as a pop singer wasn't going to take off like she expected. But not making a name for herself wasn't an option for Mona. If she wasn't going to have fame, she was going to have infamy. As such, she hung up her microphone and started dabbling in witchcraft. You know, as you do. This very drastic change in direction proved to be surprisingly lucrative for Mona. She started advertising her services as a BOMO, basically a local shaman, and over time, she built up a client base. In exchange for an extortionate amount of money, she'd perform a whole host of maleficent services. Curse her clients' enemies, gift them lucky charms, extend their lives. Whatever they needed, she knew a ritual that would make it happen. At least that's what she had people believing. And not just any people. She had some truly powerful, high-profile clients. Real VIPs, including politicians from the country's ruling party. Pretty soon, she was able to afford things like luxury cars, huge mansions, the finest jewellery money could buy. Mona had finally become the success that she had always wanted to be, but there was one thing missing. Her name was known and celebrated only by an elite chosen few, 
not by the whole nation. That was all about to change. In 1993, Malaysian politician Maslan Idris approached Mona and asked for her help. Maslan wanted to become chief minister and believed that with the help of Mona's black magic, he'd get the post. He offered her 2.5 million ringgit for her services, about 600,000 American dollars. He gave her half a million ringgit as a down payment and 10 land titles as surety for the rest. Well, of course, Mona agreed to bless him, and this blessing came in two parts. Firstly, she gave Maslan a talisman consisting of a magic cane and a headpiece, which both supposedly once belonged to Indonesian President Sukarno. She told him that these items would make him invincible. Secondly, she told Maslan to come to her home and take part in a so-called cleansing ritual. According to Mona, this would purify Maslan's spirit and ensure him the chief minister position. The superstitious Maslan agreed. Maslan arrived at Mona's home in Raub, Pahang. He found her waiting inside, along with her husband, Mohammed, and one of their assistants, Juraimi Hassan. With candles lit and the mood set, Mona told Maslan to lie on the floor. She slowly placed flowers on his body, chanting as she did to repel any negative spirits. So far, so good. When she'd finished placing the flowers, she told Maslan to close his eyes and wait for, quote unquote, the money to fall from the sky. Well, that sounded pretty good. He closed his eyes and waited. But it wasn't money that came raining down upon him. Without warning, Jeremy, Mona's assistant, chopped off Maslan's head with an axe that she had just handed him. It went rolling across the floor. The talisman of invincibility clearly didn't work. Mona, along with her husband and assistant, then cut Maslan into 18 pieces, skinned them, and buried most of him in a storeroom near the house. Some parts of him were never found, and it's theorized that the trio may have eaten some of Maslan's remains as part of their own shamanistic ritual. After this brutal act, Mona and her accomplices went on with their lives as if nothing had happened. Only difference was, they now all had a bunch of extra cash in their pockets. They all went on spending sprees, and Mona herself bought a Mercedes-Benz and invested in a facelift, no doubt hoping that her career as a pop star might actually take off someday. It wasn't long before Maslan's disappearance was noticed, however. Still, even though he was officially reported missing, for a while, the authorities had no leads to work with. That soon changed. In July of that year, Mona's assistant, Jeremy, was picked up by the cops on unrelated charges, and, while off his head on who knows what, got confused and told them everything that the trio had done that fateful night. He even led them to the storeroom where they'd hidden what was left of Maslam. His remains had been buried six feet deep and covered with a cement seal. Still, that's not much use if your accomplice can't stop himself from confessing. It wasn't long before investigators tracked down Mona and her husband as well, and soon a very public trial was underway. Mona quickly became the most talked about woman in all of Malaysia. She basked in the spotlight of it all, never hiding her face from the cameras, and almost always wearing glamorous and colourful dresses as she was paraded by guards to and from courtrooms. Rather than avert her eyes from onlookers, she instead smiled and posed as news team snapped her photo, never missing an opportunity for her newly lifted face to make the front page of newspapers. On various occasions, she was overheard saying things like, Looks like I have many fans. In her eyes, she was finally famous. A household name, albeit for one of the worst reasons possible. After two months, a verdict was finally returned. It took the jury just over an hour to reach their decision. All three of the group were found guilty and sentenced to death. Mona's reaction to hearing her life would soon end? She said, I'm happy and thank you to all Malaysians. She left the courtroom, smiling. The day before their sentence was carried out, Mona and her accomplices requested a last meal of KFC. She met with her family one last time and said her goodbyes. Then, on the 2nd of November, 2001, at 5.59am, Mona, her husband, and her assistant, Jeremy, were all hanged. Her final chilling words? Aku takan mati. I will never die. She was completely calm during the entire ordeal and was reportedly smiling when the black hood was placed over her head. 
two of her abandoned mansions still stand and are frequently visited by local ghost hunters, all hoping to meet with the wandering spirit of Mona Fandi, Pahang's most notorious shaman. Here's a highly debated one from the Philippines that's equal parts dark and cryptic. I'll give you a quick overview of the case, and then get into the real mystery of it all. Marijoy and Jacqueline Cheong, 21 and 23 respectively, were two sisters living on the island of Cebu. Back in 1997, their lives came to a grisly end when they were taken by a group of seven men while they were waiting for their ride outside a shopping mall. Those men were Rowan Adelwan, Alberto Cano, Ariel Balansak, Josman Asna, James Andrew Oi, James Anthony Oi, and most famously, Paco Laranyaga. More on him later. The men allegedly forced the two young women into the back of their van, and then did things to them that I don't want to talk about here. Later, they drove them to a ravine, and pushed Marijoy over the edge. Her body was found two days later. Jacqueline, on the other hand, has never been found to this day. All seven of the men were eventually tracked down and arrested. A trial was quickly underway, and rested on the back of the prosecutor's star witness, Davidson Rusia. Rusia claimed to have been with the seven suspects when the women were taken, and in return for complete immunity, said that he had testified to that in court. Rusia was handsome, well-mannered, and spoke English fluently. These attributes, combined with him coming clean about what had happened, won him the respect and adulation of the general public and the jury. His confession was enough to get all seven of the accused found guilty, and each of them were condemned to death. Case closed? Come on, you know it isn't. All seven of the now guilty men professed their innocence for years while awaiting their sentence to be carried out. They said that Rusia must have been forced by the police to lie about what had happened, that this was some sort of elaborate cover-up. They must have chosen to make Rusia the key witness because they had come across best in the public eye. Indeed, Rusia had been involved with numerous gangs over the years, and one of his mantras was, do what the leader tells you to do, and he will take care of you. Only this time they said that he was doing just what the authorities were telling him to do. The parents of all seven convicted men agreed, and said there was no way their sons could have committed such a heinous act. Of course, it's not uncommon for guilty men to maintain their innocence, nor for their parents to stand by them. On the other side of things, the Chong sisters' parents, Thelma and Dionysio Chong, said that the men's guilt spoke for itself. So here's where things get interesting. Many years later, in 2018, after all seven men had spent 21 years behind bars, a bizarre discovery was made online. Several pictures were found on Facebook, posted by various members of the Chong sisters' family, including their own mother, Thelma. These photos featured two women that share an uncanny resemblance to Marijoy and Jacqueline. Like, a scary resemblance. In the minds of the people who found the photos and the families of the imprisoned men, this was proof that the Chong sisters were still alive and well, living in Canada, and that, like they thought, this whole case had been concocted by higher powers. Impossible. I mean, Marijoy's body was found at the bottom of a ravine, and even though Jacqueline's was never found, she surely suffered the same fate, right? Well, that's the thing. The body in the ravine that was identified as Marijoy's? It was never formally identified, and there's a lot of doubt over whether it was really her or not. If it really is them in these photos, that means that both women were never slain, and that the whole case was staged for who knows what reason. Okay, what's going on here? Well, like I said, the families of the convicted men were, and still are certain, that their brothers and sons didn't take the girls' lives. What I didn't make clear was that many people in the Philippines agree with them. Even before these photos surfaced, there had been several suspicious developments in the Chong sisters' case. For instance, during the men's trial, Rusia, the prosecution's star witness, was only allowed to be cross-examined by the defense team for 30 minutes, despite the fact that his testimony lasted for several days. Why? Paco Laranyaga's involvement in the whole thing is also highly questionable. A whopping 45 witnesses came forward and swore under oath that it was impossible for Paco to have taken the girls' lives. According to them, he was in Quezon City when the killings took place, and didn't travel to Cebu until the day after the whole incident. There was even a note in a logbook belonging to a security guard at Paco's condominium, stating that he returned to his home in Quezon City at 2.45am on July 16th, the very night the Chong sisters' lives were taken. 
Flight records were also presented by airport personnel, showing that Paco didn't take a flight on July 16th, 1997, and seemingly proving that he flew to Cebu the day after. All that's to say, he almost certainly wasn't in the city when it took place. All of this evidence was considered irrelevant by the judge for whatever reason. To many people now looking into the case, this was starting to seem like a cover-up. Luckily for Paco, his mother was Spanish, and as such, he was a Spanish citizen. With Spain being part of the EU, it of course opposed his capital sentence. If the Filipino government took his life, they'd be in breach of the principle of reciprocity, since the Spanish government would never take the life of a Filipino citizen in their custody. As such, in 2009, after serving 12 years in a Filipino prison, Paco was transferred back to Spain, where he'll serve the rest of his sentence. Today, he's allowed to leave the prison several times a week to work as a chef at a restaurant, and is classified as a third-degree inmate the least dangerous classification. As for the other convicted men, their death sentences were retracted, and four of them were actually released early due to the fact that they were young when the slayings took place. All four of them were eventually forced to surrender and return to jail at the request of President Duterte, who personally decided they should not be free men. Duterte also barred the man responsible for signing their release papers. But the question remains, are any of the men guilty at all? And if not, who is? Now, more than 20 years later, the Chong sisters' case remains a confusing mess, shrouded in mystery. There are those who believe the group of killers are getting off too softly, those who believe it's all just a huge miscarriage of justice, those who think it's a government conspiracy designed to protect the real culprits, and those who think the slayings never happened at all, and that both girls are alive and well, living in Canada. It's important to keep in mind that the women in those photos could just be family members who share a strong resemblance to Marjo and Jacqueline. There's still not a huge amount of information on this case available in English, but from what I've researched online, I think I've covered all the bases. I know I have a lot of viewers from the Philippines, so I'd like to hear your thoughts about the case down in the comments, and see what the average citizen thinks happened in this one. In keeping with the bizarreness of the previous two cases, let's take a trip over to India for this last one, and examine the recent, grim mystery of the Burari deaths. Burari, Central Delhi District. Back in 2018, this was home to the Chundawats, a respectable, middle-class family consisting of 11 members. With the head of the family, Bhopal, having passed, the matriarch and new head of the household was 77-year-old Narayan Devi. Living with her were her two sons, Bhavnesh and Lalit, their wives, Savita and Tina, daughter, Pratiba, and five grandchildren, Priyanka, Nita, Monu, Dhruv, and Shivam. The family made their money in plywood and groceries, and owned two stores in town. Their grocery shop, the centerpiece of the whole neighborhood, was on the first floor of their home. On the morning of July 1st, 2018, Local shoppers were surprised to find the store still closed with the lights off. Strange. Bhavnesh, the eldest son, cherished the business like one of his children. Nobody could remember a time where he opened the store late. As the morning went by, nobody from the family had come downstairs to open the shop doors. Concerned, a friend of the family decided to go inside and check that everything was alright. Bizarrely, the door was still open. He entered and what he found inside was like a scene from a horror movie. Hanging in a circular formation from the hallway ceiling were ten bodies, swinging back and forth like tree branches in the wind. Their hands were bound behind their backs, blindfolds covered their eyes, tape covered their mouths, cotton wool plugged their ears, pieces of cloth masked all of their faces. Five stools stood on the floor beneath them. The only other family member 77-year-old Narayan was found lying on the floor, all of the life squeezed out of her. The Chindawats were no more. Their family friend ran outside and sounded the alarm, and one of India's darkest and weirdest cases was officially under investigation. Detectives on the case were faced with several difficult questions. Who had done this to the family? The respectable Chindawats didn't have any known enemies. Why were ten of them hanging so ritualistically, yet the family's matriarch wasn't? 
What was the significance of the taped mouths, wrapped eyes, covered faces, and blocked ears? An autopsy confirmed that all the family members' lives had ended without a struggle. There was nothing untoward in any of their systems. The first thing the authorities had to establish was whether the Chindawats had done this to themselves, or if they had been slain by some unknown perp or perps. The fact that there were five stools in the room, and that nobody in the family had struggled, suggested the former, but it didn't make any sense that they would have all tied their hands behind their backs and covered their eyes, mouths, ears and faces. Not to mention, some of their feet were still touching the ground slightly. The blindfolds and face coverings had all been cut from a single bedsheet inside the house, so if this whole thing was the Chintawat's own doing, then it appeared to have been a very spur-of-the-moment decision with minimal planning. Several other bizarre clues came to light when the investigators examined the scene. Most notably, eight cell phones belonging to the family were found taped inside a drawer, hidden from view. What did this all mean? The detectives soon learned that Lalit, the 45-year-old second son of Narayan, who was also found swinging in the hallway, had been acting very strangely in the days leading up to the incident. He'd been talking about how his deceased father was appearing to him in his dreams, and how his old man was trying to possess him. They pursued this lead, and found 11 diaries and a number of notebooks belonging to Lalit that took this investigation in a completely unexpected direction. For the past 11 years, Lalit had been documenting his obsession with Moksha, a set of rituals that were meant to bring about the salvation of his family's souls. You see, Lalit had a side hobby. The occult. And what's more, he'd somehow gotten his whole family interested in his strange practices. His notebooks and diaries detailed the strange rituals that they had all been practicing, and how they believed these rituals were bringing them closer to summoning the spirit of their deceased patriarch, Narayan's husband, Bopal. The most vital piece of evidence found in these notes, however, were instructions written by Lalit himself on how the family should tie their hands behind their backs, and how they should cover their faces in preparation for the so-called Kriya, the ritual that would finally allow them to meet their patriarch's spirit. It also stated that since Narayan couldn't stand, she would complete the ritual on the floor. Since their remains were found in the same way Lalit had specified in his notes, it quickly became clear that the family had done this to themselves. They had obviously been planning this for a long time, and had somehow managed to keep it a secret from everybody. Nobody in the neighborhood had any idea that the family were actually practicing dark magic. The most haunting part of all of this is that it appears that the Chindawats thought they'd actually survived the ritual. Lalit himself had written in his notes, Everyone will tie their own hands, and when the Kriya is done, then everyone will help each other untie their hands. He'd even made notes about how they were going to perform the Kriya again a week later to bring fortune to another relative. Priyanka was engaged to be wed that next week as well, and the whole family had been excitedly preparing for the event. They all had future plans and aspirations. They clearly didn't expect things to end the way they did. Though from an outsider's perspective, it's hard to see how they couldn't have. Lalit was clearly a delusional man, and investigators concluded that this was all a case of shared psychotic disorder, and that the family had decided to follow Lalit's instructions without question. Still, it's hard to imagine how one goes about convincing ten family members to willingly go through with such a plan. Despite all of the evidence, there are of course still those who believe that someone else was responsible for what happened to the Chundawats. However, without any other evidence, suspects, or possible motive, I think it's safe to say that this case has officially been solved. Hey guys, Lazy here, and thank you very much for listening. So these were some fun and bizarre ones, let's put it that way. But yeah, I've kind of come up with this region lock series idea, so if you'd like to hear more cases from other countries that are quote unquote region locked, let me know in the comments down below, and I just might make a sequel. A huge thank you to Robin Mickelson for making the thumbnail for this video. He's a real artistic legend, so make sure to check him out via the links down in the bio. And also I'd like to say a huge thank you to all of my supporters here on YouTube and over on Patreon, especially my biggest supporters. Hamish K, Phantom Knight, Amanda Hansom, Kelvin Bourne, Expand On, The Lecky, Leonardo Martinez, Hungry and Hammered, Aura Dragon One, Ricky Cohen Jr., The Only Dorita, Lord 210, Azrael Warakai, Infamous Sempapi, 
decaying go. Connor Lothan, Tawny, Nadine, Sloane Crawford, Sarah Ramirez, Anime Wimp, Charlie Lackey, Gina Valera, Procubidine Netta, Philip Westra, Alex Greensall, Tom King, Monica Mendoza, and Crawford K. McDonald. Thank you guys so much for your continued support. It really helps the channel out. That wraps things up for this one, guys. Final video of the year, so uh, happy new year to all of you. I know this year hasn't been so great, but uh, fingers crossed for the next one, hey? So until January, you all stay spooky. And remember, the best things happen in the dark.